I have a question to see who was paying attention last week. Uh Uh-oh. So if you weren't here last week, that gives you a bye. (laughs) Yes, I see a couple of people. Yes. (laughs) Of course, you shouldn't have missed last week, but that's a whole different story. But I normally say something at, at this table different than is written or most other pastors that you've heard. And I didn't say it last week. He's got the right answer. We'll get to it here in a minute. This morning is about communion. Last week we had, a, we had about baptism. We had a baptism. And this morning is all about communion, right? We get the 1 Corinthians 11 and Mark chapter 14. And there are several other chapters... Um, Matthew has a chapter on it. Luke has, has, a, has a part on it. John has, has a part on the, the Last Supper. But what's different? Can anybody tell me what's different about John than Matthew, Mark, and Luke? We'll get to the... That special bonus for confirmation kids. We'll get to that in a minute, too. But a lot of the commentaries that I read, a lot of stuff that I talked about said we wouldn't even really have to have a sermon this morning. Because when we do this, what do we do? When we take communion, when you partake of communion, when you come forward and get the bread and you get the the wine, what do you do? Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. And by doing this, it actually says it in Corinthians. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This meal, this foretaste of the the heavenly banquet is proclamation of everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did. So if there's nothing else, you just need to have that. Because that proclaims that Jesus came here and he lived and he did everything that he did and he went to the cross and he died for you. Because that's what he said it did. Every time that you do that, that is making that clear, not only to yourselves, but to everybody else. Well, we have to look here a little bit at this passage from Corinthians, because it's kind of interesting, I think. Right? What's going on in Corinth that Paul has to write these words to the Corinthians? Right? This is the passage that you get a, that I heard a lot about in seminary, especially this part down here. Whoever, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of our Lord. Examine yourselves and only eat and drink the bread from the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. Right? If we do it in an unworthy manner or we do it in a way that we don't understand what it is we're not only not getting what Jesus said we were getting but we're bringing condemnation and judgment upon ourselves that's pretty heavy so do we understand what we're doing every time we come up here You're all, are you all that intently listening? Because it's like really quiet right now. You're all worried about this. Don't be. It's okay. You should be. There you go. <laughs> right? We have to look at this top part to see why Paul is saying this down here, right? The Corinthian community is an interesting community. It's a community that's made up of, of multiple layers of society, right? It's a, it's a community that, that met in someone's house because they had the means by which to have people come to their place of dwelling. So this, that means that this person was, was better off than some of the people. We also know that this community in Corinth contained not only the elite and the rich in society, but it also contained slaves and, and, and workers, you know, your normal class. So this was, a, this was kind of like us right here, right? We have some people of means here. We have some people that don't have the means here. We have all in between, right? So it's a mixed community of people. They're not all from the same um, 
eco status from the same level of society, right? We, they're not all elite. They're not all just regular Joes. They're not all slaves. They are a mix of all of the above. And what was happening in Corinth was that those who could gather were gathering early on in the day. They were going to the, whoever the person's house it was and they were gathering and they were, and they were eating together. And then when the other people could get there, you know, the, the regular workers and the slaves, after they'd finished everything they had to do, would show up. And we have to remember, when, the, when they're eating together, they're in the dining room. And right, and how many of you have a dining room in your house? And how many will it seat? Twelve, I got. Okay, so in this house, in these, in these houses in Corinth, more than likely the seating areas in the elite houses would only seat about nine people reclining around the table. Reclining, they actually like laid down to eat, right? The tables were only like this high. They weren't like tables that we sit at with chairs. They were shorter tables, so they would lay down by them and they would eat at them. So the room that this person probably had for the people to gather to eat a meal together would probably only hold like nine people. So when the, the average workers and the slaves showed up, there's no place in this dining area for them to come and eat. If there's any food left, right? Because the people have come in and they've started eating and they've eaten and they're eating and they're waiting for the rest of the people to show up. It's not like communion today where we all come up here together, right? One commentary I listened, one podcast I listened to talked about how in, in communion in this meal, we're all put on an equal playing field because we all get the same thing. Some of you get a bigger chunk than others. Maybe that's because it's harder to rip it off. Maybe that's because the person giving to you thinks you need it that week. I don't know. But we all get the same thing. We get a chunk of bread. We dip it in the wine. There's no express lane for people who give more. There's no express lane for people that we want to be a part of our community. Can you imagine the ushers? The ushers are going, wait a minute, what are we doing? I'm not going to be an usher anymore. What? what? Right? Everybody's on an equal playing field. We all come the same. Because that's what Jesus said. Everybody is welcome here. Regardless of who you are, regardless of what your status is in society, regardless of what anybody else thinks about you, I love you and I want you to come to my table. So he invited us to come. And these people in Corinth are gathering to eat a meal together. Right? The early church actually gathered and ate a meal together. And during that meal, they celebrated communion because that's where it came from. We hear that here in 1 Corinthians when the Passover happened, right? And in Mark, we see that on the day of Passover, when the lamb was sacrificed, they gathered to eat the Passover meal. It's in the, it's in the mix of an actual sit down to eat dinner. That Jesus took bread and wine and did this miraculous thing and giving us his body and his blood to give us his love and his grace and his mercy. So in the early church, they actually sat down together to eat a meal. And in doing that, the, the elite probably got there a lot earlier than everybody else. And they ate their fill and they drank more wine than they should have. And they didn't include the other people. They left out those who had to work. They left out those who had things to do to come before they, before they could come and be there. And that's not what Jesus said. Because on the night that he was betrayed, our readings all say, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to all of them and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And then he picked up the cup and he gave it to them and all of them drank from it. But here's the problem with that word betrayed. And it's actually in both of our readings. And if you listen very closely here in a little bit, hopefully I won't mess it up this week. Last week I, I was caught off guard by a... By, I was laughing at something that was happening over here. So, and I read the words written on my page. Because it actually says on my page, betrayed. It is indeed right. It is indeed right. Our duty and our joy... Uh, da, 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 da. No, it's a little bit later. In the night in which he was betrayed. It's on this page. Right here. You can't see it, but it says it right there. In the night in which he was betrayed. The problem with that word is it puts the focus on who? Say it louder. Judas. And who is the focus of this night supposed to be? Jesus. 
It's not supposed to be Judas. It's supposed to be Jesus. And when we say in the night in which he was betrayed, that automatically makes every last one of us think about the person that betrayed Jesus and not about Jesus and not about what Jesus is doing. You see, because all of us at one point in time have betrayed Jesus. We're all sinners. We've all done God wrong. We've all betrayed Jesus. But you know what? Jesus still loves us. Because that's what that meal is about. And that word betrayed, which is in Corinthians, and it's in Mark, and it's in Matthew, and it's in Luke, and it's in John, is not the basically the right way to, re- to translate that word. The word is paradidomi. Para did do me. Um, para or para is over. And did do me is to hand. So the word literally means in the night in which he was handed over. Which if you listen as I do the words of institution on normal days, I say in the, in the night in which he was handed over. Because Judas couldn't betray Jesus. You're supposed to say now, well, wait a minute, Pastor. You just said we all betrayed Jesus. Yes, we do all betray Jesus. But here's the, here's the problem with betraying Jesus. In order to betray somebody, that person can't have foreknowledge of the fact that you're going to do something against them. I see some... Right? Who has the power in a betrayal? The betrayer or the betrayee? The betrayer. Who has the power on this night when Jesus tells Judas to do what he has to do? And he takes the bread and he blesses it and he gives it to all of them, including the one who hands him over. Jesus has the power because if Jesus wanted to stop Judas, he could have. And why handed over is a better way to look at it is it's not the focus on Judas because this handing over doesn't just happen by Judas. It happens by Pilate and it happens by the Pharisees and it happens by the Jewish high council. All of these people hand Jesus over to the cross. All of these people hand him over to that death that he had to die. So that all of us could be in that right relationship. You see, it's not about Judas. It's all about Jesus. And it's all about the fact that he said that this is my body. And this is my blood. Given and shed for. Who? You. You. Given and shed for. The entirety of all the world. And everyone is welcome. Because that's what Jesus said. So know that this table is a table where we get a foretaste of that meal that is to come. And this table is a table where we get to see God's love, grace, and mercy poured out for all of us. And this table is the place that even if you don't feel welcome anyplace else... You will always be welcomed because Jesus loves you just as you are. And he wants you to understand that love. And he wants you to share that love with all of the world. So know that you're welcome and help the rest of the world understand that they're welcome too.